All right. So, hi everybody. I'm Dr. Paul Terrier. It's nice to meet you. So, um, I know I've kind of seen a couple of you a couple of times at some of my talks. I've been talking at AER for about a year now. Um, I really like having you guys as an audience and so forth. You're all really fun and the uptake of my uh, talks has been really good. So, you know, thank you for having me back. Um, so, just a little bit about me. So, I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor in Alberta. I've been practicing here for actually four years in November, so it's been just about four years. Um, yeah, no, my specialties, I have a lot of specialties. It's naturopathic aesthetics, so like facelifts and things like that, and um, you know, rejuvenation, um, mental and emotional care, advanced detoxification, treatment of chronic illnesses. Hello, oh, come on in. Can started? Yes. Sorry. We that's all right. Outside. Oh no, that's, you know, come on in. So, um, uh, where was I? Advanced detoxification, infectious disease prevention. Hmm, I know there's more. I, I do a lot of, oh, also weight loss. So, and hormonal balancing as well. So I do quite a lot of things. Um, yeah, no, so it's nice to meet you all. Um, today I'm here to talk about men's health, which is a very interesting topic um, in and of itself. So, do any of you guys have any specific aspects that you want, you know, um, discussed before, um, or for me to, like, I've got, a t I've got a talk laid out, but if you guys have any specific things you want me to talk about, now is a good time to tell me. Any, anyone have any, like, specific things about men's health that they want to know about? Yes. Um, when you talk about um, ranges for hormones, let's say levels. Yeah. You're basing that on what, a sedentary population? That's a very good question. And so I'm just wondering, if you're within a range, an MD is going to tell you you're within a range, is it, everything's okay, but do we take, are we concerned about one, the test we get, and second of all, uh, where you stand in that range, how that makes a difference? I will address that. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's, that's a very question. good question. Anyone else? So hormone testing ranges. The great question of laboratory medicine for the past centuries. How do you tell what's normal and not? So, anyone else? All right. Well, if anything comes up, just you know, shriek out, and I'll I'll do that, or throw something at me, or something, you know. So anyway, um, men's health is an interesting topic because um, for those of you who follow history or or who have an interest in feminist history or anything like that, you're quite well aware that men were the basis of all models of health up until about the 1970s or so forth. All diseases were taken from their pictures in men, and many diseases do have differing pictures in men and women. And many of the and uh, men were just kind of taken as the default state of humanity, and women were thought of like where women were different, they were thought of as a deviation from men. <laughs> Thanks. I'm not saying this is accurate. I don't think it is, but that was that was what happened. It was like. Well, it was like in the 17th century when they talked about the rights of man and so forth. They really meant it that way. It was the rights of man, not the rights of woman, the rights of man. And it was the same way. It was the physiology of man and everything else like that. And, you know, we've, you know, very rightfully corrected that over the last, um, over the last couple of decades. Like, not completely, but to a large extent. Um, so, for, because, despite the fact that, you know, most of uh, medicine was based on men up until recently, men are actually one of the least well-served populations. Men tend to die earlier, be sicker, and have much more chronic health problems than women do. There's a number of reasons for this, um, but we'll get into those in a little bit. Men, in addition to this, men's hormonal system is like this vast mystery. Men know that they have hormones now. This was not always the case. Like, really, how far have we come? Men have hormones and are influenced by them. Like that should be like in stars and flashing lights and everything. We've kind of acknowledged that, but men also have hormonal cycles. These cycles are different than women, but they do exist. We know next to nothing about them. Like this kind of knowledge in, in popular medicine and popular um, in medical um, commentary is almost absent entirely. This is not because of a lack of research, or this is because of a lack of research, but these hormonal cycles are a lot less apparent than women's are. Women's hormonal cycles are ma marked by a number of external factors. Things change on the outside, things change on the inside, conception happens or doesn't happen, menstruation happens. Men's, um, men's hormonal cycles tend to be marked by behavioral and biochemical changes, which makes them a lot more difficult to chart out. 
So there, we are just starting to learn more about them, and they are. And so they're beginning to become less mysterious, but we just need to acknowledge that yes, men have hormonal cycles, and as well, men have hormonal cycle dysregulations. So in addition, and again, there's very few experts in this field. So yeah, that's kind of contributing to some of the underservice of men um, in medicine. When you combine this, this like bit of information with the fact that there are a large number of men who are getting older and who are having problems associated with that, there is an increase in chronic disease in our society in older individuals, and older people in general have chronic disease. So there's, there's likely to be quite a few problems with this in the future that need to be addressed, and there's just not a lot of knowledge about that right now. Some of this neglect of men's health is due to cultural factors. Men tend not to come in for health care that often. This is not the same case in every culture, but in North America it tends to be. Um, I was joking with one of the other, with um, one of the staff here just a little while, or with Amy just a little, a minute ago, that one of the big problems with men is, at least until recently, they would just never go to the doctor. Wouldn't go to the doctor for 30 years, then, you know, die of a heart attack. Um, that's changed to a certain extent now. Now with um, kind of the, I'm, I'm not going to mention the brand name of it, but there's a drug for erectile dysfunction. You all know which one it is. Um, just because I'm recording myself. Um, there's a drug for brand name, uh, for a drug for um, erectile dysfunction now, which really broke the taboo about talking about that. So now, men will come, tend to come in if they're dying or if they can't get an erection. Those are the two reasons that a lot of men tend to do that. Like, all right, I can't get an erection. I think I'm going to die. Um, Pretty big issues. Yeah, no, those are, they tend to leave things till the end. And um, it's really, it's kind of funny that way. Um, I remember one of my lab instructors actually was talking about this man who was a chronic alcoholic. Um, so he had ascites. So ascites is when you've got a lot of flu in your abdomen. So it looked like he was like, you know, quite pregnant. Uh, his skin was yellow. He stank of urea, which are all signs of end stage uh, liver failure. And um, the thing that actually brought him into the doctor was he couldn't get an erection. He didn't know like what kind of woman would go near him, but um, yeah. So this is a cultural thing, and this can be changed with education. So that's what I'm trying to do here, and you know, by putting this on YouTube and everything. So out of the vast myriad of hu of health conditions that really affect that really affect everyone, um, I just picked out with no particular justification. We could have talked about anything. These main issues to focus on in our in our talk today. So these, um, these particular uh, diseases and disease groupings do tend to affect men quite differently than women, so we're gonna be talking about the, the male aspect of it. I'm going to be doing a talk on uh, feet women's health, I believe next month, and so I will be, do and so we will, um, I will be addressing the female side of many of these at that point, so stay tuned. Oh. So, hormonal disorders. So, men have hormones their hormone cycle. These hormonal cycles impact men's health and men's mental well-being. That has actually begun to populate the, um, the media landscape lately, but it has in a very interesting form. It's populated the media landscape in the sense of this, this um, and I'm gonna use my quotation marks, this disease here of low T or low testosterone levels. Many men are kind of starting to either supplement themselves with uh, testosterone or with a number of products that are supposed to raise the levels of testosterone that their bodies produce. Um, kind of low testosterone is held responsible for a lot of things like low sex drive, erectile dysfunction, decreased energy, muscle mass, brain fog, depression, really there's quite a lot. And testosterone hormonal health does interact with all of these things. Um, there's quite a supplement, there's quite an industry about this right now. There's a number of people who just will get directly inject testosterone, use testosterone replacement creams and so forth. And um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the days in uh, high school and everywhere else where there was that one kid who always, you know, just, you know, started to inject himself with testosterone to be you know, bigger and stronger and better and a better athlete and so forth. So this has been a practice that's been around for a while. It's become embraced a little bit more as a health, as a health treatment now because there's this assumption that low testosterone is behind all of these issues. Um, yeah, no, so we covered this. It does is that seem, what, I'm sorry, yeah. is that what those bodybuilders 
were getting themselves? Yeah. When they're calling it anabolic steroid, that's, yeah. that's basically testosterone. Oh, uh, Very, I didn't know what that was. Yeah, no, it's basic. Uh, we'll talk about what testosterone is, but yes, it, there's this group of hormones called steroid hormones. So mm -hmm. that's one of them. Yeah. So testosterone supplementation does seem to help uh, some men very well. Long-term risks, however, are unknown. You know why they're unknown? Nobody's looked. So we used to do a lot of hormone replacement therapy with women as well. And um, anyone remen remember the whole thing with that a couple years ago? Turns out it increases cancer risk and heart attacks and quite a load of other things. Um, this is just me completely speculating, but I think it'll do um, long-term testosterone replacement therapy does the same thing to, to men. So that's, I don't think it's a too big of an assumption to suspect that. Second of all, I didn't put a slide in about this, but um, there is, as you, as you discussed earlier, this issue that testosterone can be lowered and testosterone can be lowered or testosterone can be lowered, that testosterone is low and that is the cause of everyone's problems. Steroid hormones in general have, are very, very tricky to measure in terms of a laboratory. They tend to vary throughout the day, throughout the season, depending on one's hormonal cycle, with, and hormonal cycles aren't that well known. So all of these factors kind of play into that. In addition to that, there's an assumption that there is that the ranges which usually are captured on healthy people in their you know 20s and 30s um, are those are the ranges you need to be at. It tends to, it's a very static view and it doesn't take into account the fact that people do have changes throughout life. We see this um, in a number of aspects like you know the way that menopause was frequently assumed to be a uh, disease until recently. Like no, it's not. Menopause is a Menopause is not a disease, it's a healthy phase of life that's become patho like medically pathologized. We treat it often as a disease, but, um, and it has, just because of our lifestyle, often become, you know, less, much more difficult, or sorry, much more difficult than it should be. The same thing with changing hormone and changing testosterone levels throughout life. It is natural for men to have a waning of testosterone as they get older. That's not usually a problem. The problem is, similar to menopause, when our physiology starts acting up because of you know, the inherent difficulties that, or the um, imbalances we have in our physiology. The, forgive me, I'm a bit scattered right now. I had coffee today, so that never happens. The problem is not that testosterone is lowering. The problem is that when testosterone goes down, quite often a lot of the inherent pathologies that you know, higher testosterone levels kept under control start to surface at that point. In a healthy society, men's testosterone levels go down, their sex drive still stays at an adequate level, their stress levels don't go down, their brain works, and their energy levels maintain themselves. In an unhealthy society, testosterone can kind of stave that off, but when it starts to you know, plummet naturally as it normally does, those kind of problems come out. So what people are treating with testosterone therapy is not the actual problem that these men have. What they're treating is these men's deeper uh, health issues coming out. Does that make sense? Testosterone is like a big band-aid over someone that's hemorrhaging. It just keeps that, it just keeps the blood in a little bit longer and eventually there will be consequences towards doing that. There will be consequences towards not, in, uh, there will be consequences towards adding in those extra hormones and towards not addressing the health issues that are causing these problems in the first place. Second of all, the problem with the direct supplementation of testosterone approach is that it kind of takes testosterone as a hormone that just exists all by itself. And if any of you have kind of listened to me talk before, you'll have realized that that's not the way life works. Horm the hormonal system, like any system within biology or medicine, it intricately interacts with every other system in your body. So the hormonal system itself tends to, there are three hormonal organs that I really tend to emphasize a lot of and they're on the next slide. So this is the hormonal triangle. I call it the hormonal triangle of misery. Um, it's the hormonal triangle, yeah, because like, I used to call it the hormonal triangle of death, but that wasn't accurate because people tend not to die as much from it, but they do tend to be very miserable. So up the top, you have a thyroid. Bottom left, you have adrenal glands, and bottom right, you have tes uh, your uh, testicles, and in the middle, kind of acting like as a garbage dump and as a metabol, these are for all of these, is the liver. So, 
So we'll get into these in each in a little bit more detail. I start with the adrenals because in our society, the adrenals are almost always the first to go. It's very rarely the testicles themselves or the testes themselves or the thyroid. It is usually the adrenals. So the adrenals are your body's glands for short and long-term stress. They produce a number of different hormonal compounds. They produce um, epinephrine, which it's epinephrine in uh, much of the world, but it's adrenaline in the United States and Canada. So adrenaline. You know, when you get the adrenaline rush, and like, oh my god, bum, 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 bum. I'm going to beat the crap out of you, or I'm going to run away, or I'm going to freeze. That's adrenaline. It's your immediate reaction to something that freaks you out right then and there. Um, most of the time. Some people get stuck in that for years and years and years, and that needs to be dealt with. No, sir, that, that does actually happen. People stay in adrenaline mode for a long time, and that's, that's not good. It's very treatable, but it's, you, know, you don't want to stay there. So the second group of hormones, there's other hormones that they make, um, such as glucocorticoids, which regulate blood sugar, mineralocorticoids, which regulate iron balance, and then there's steroid hormones. So steroid hormones, steroid hormones and glucocorticoids tend to, tend to overlap quite a bit, but steroid hormones are the ones that we're really going to talk about here. They tend to be responsible for maintaining the long-term stress of your body. Um, we supplement them in this society as well. The best well-known or the most well-known one that we that we um, take externally is cortisone. So your body does make cortisone inside of itself, but quite often, yeah, issues emerge. So the big issue is our body is not designed to deal with chronic long-term stress forever. It just does not work that way. Our body is capable of dealing with long-term stress for a period, and that the length of that period depend, depends on how healthy the individual is and their own genetic capacity to do that. But eventually, everyone starts to run out of the nutrients that they need to make these, um, these uh, uh, steroid hormones. They start to run out of the ability to make them, and their levels start to plummet. So the steroid hormones tend to do a number of things. They tend to increase your blood sugar, so you have more energy. They tend to stop digestion. They tend to decrease pain so that if you're running away from a tiger or you're dealing with a chronic injury or something, you can, you can deal with that and still maintain function. And they tend to, yeah, they do tend, yeah, no, that's, that's really the big three that they do. Um, when your body starts to run out of these hormones, all of the bad effects take, um, oh, yeah, sorry, they pretend, they um, also promote the storage of fat. So. When you run out of these hormones, your body does tend to, um, all the bad effects tend to stay, but the good effects go away. So one of the first things to go is you start to have chronic pain. Um, your blood sugar or your energy levels tend to drop, but your blood sugar tends to stay high, and your body does tend to start storing fat more and so forth. So everything tends to get dysregulated. A very good clinical, like a good idea about this is what you see in people with diabetes. There's very similar uh, clinic or very similar clinical pictures between chronic like adrenal overstimulation and metabolic syndrome diabetes type pictures. They're, they're very close together. And you know, I, if, um, I did a talk on metabolic syndrome uh, about a month and a bit ago here, so it's on YouTube and you can, you can um, look that up if you want some more information about that. But yeah, no, so in this, in our society, the big problem is chronic stress. We have this unrelenting amount of stress and things to do and very little socially sanctioned time we can just take off and relax. How many of us check emails at night? How many of us check emails on vacations? How many of us are still kind of online all the time doing work or doing work, you know, related things when we should be sitting down and relaxing? we have a very poor way of dealing with chronic long-term stress in, in our society just because of our connectivity. Um, yeah, so this tends to be the thing that really sets both men and women off. So if you didn't know, I, I know this is a complicated diagram, but it's not like there's gonna be a test <coughs> afterwards or anything. So this guy here, <coughs> this is cholesterol. And we've all heard a lot about cholesterol, and we've all heard how horrible cholesterol is uh, for us. It's not really so bad, but it's the big thing with cholesterol is cholesterol gets turned into everything. There's a number of metabolic pathways that cholesterol become, that cholesterol um, gets transformed into a number of hormones that have a very vast input in our bodies. 
So if cholesterol goes this way, it turns into aldosterone. Aldosterone is, hmm? It's a smart. We have a smart word. Oh, Jesus. Mm. I'll just point. We have aldosterone, which, which um, does a great deal of work with our mineral balance. So it keeps, when there's a lot of aldosterone, we tend to excrete potassium and, um, and uh, keep sodium in, in terms of our kidneys. So that has um, quite a few issues in terms of uh, blood pressure. We have corticosterone, which is, um, it is that chronic long-term stress hormone we just described. Cortisol, yay. We come down here to this metabolic pathway, turns into, um, cholesterol turns into estrogen, and testosterone. There's two things I'd really like you to take, um, take away from the slide. That is the ability, the um, interconnectivity of all of these hormonal pathways and how close estrogen and testosterone are. Estrogen is actually made out of testosterone. Like that's it, you need to make testosterone before you make it into estrogen and so forth. So they're really, really metabolically close. And we'll get into the reasons why that is important in a little bit. Yes? So it just goes one direction? No. So it goes back. can go back to testosterone. Yes. Okay. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we will talk about that in a little bit. Um, most of these are kind of, most of these do kind of go back and forth a little bit. Predominantly, testosterone goes into estrogen, but some, I think, does come back. Oh, and this one down here is dihydrotestosterone. That's the active form. Plain old testosterone tends not to do as much, but dihydrotestosterone is actually, that's the metabolite that does a lot of good stuff. So let me give you that low T gel they're giving you dehydrated testosterone? I'm not sure about that. I think they give you, they, I think sometimes they give you testosterone, sometimes they give you uh, DHT. So it depends, on, it depends on the preparation. Largely they're giving you one of the two, however. So what happens when we are in chronic stress is that your body does have a limited, a limited supply of the nutrients it needs to make these hormones. There's, you know, our body doesn't have an infinite supply of everything. So a lot of that, a lot of that nutrition will get sucked off. Uh, that nutrition and those cofactors will get sucked off into your adrenal glands. That's why I, instead of the normal, you know, back and forth that I showed in the first slide, there or the first uh, triangle slide, there is this big arrow. Everything's getting sucked up by the adrenal glands. This, when this happens in women, the result is a couple of things that we have, like we can have no problems. We can have uh, PMS. We can have just no, we can have um, just other hormonal issues, or sometimes in some women, for whatever reason, it gets put off until menopause, and then you just have a really difficult menopause. With men, same thing happens. You either have, you can have some men who just start ha in their 20s. You know, they're really stressed out, and they have low sex drives, and they start having you know erectile difficulties and so forth. Or sometimes you just have really hard what's called andropause. So andropause is a very similar, t um, it's a very similar thing to menopause in women. It's just men's testosterone tends to lower. They tend to enter into a new metabolic phase in life. So some men just have a really hard time with this. Um, so if harder than in other words, maybe like yeah. you know with that chronic stress and mm -hmm. really stress in our lives, that mm -hmm. essentially, I mean puts our adrenal gland into overdrive. Our adrenal gland is taking those nutrients, taking our energy yep. to deal with our stress yep. at the expense of the testes and the thyroid and yep. what they would normally do with yes. their share of... Nope. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. Thank you. I am mindful. Sometimes I get into doctor speak and I know that not everyone can understand me. So if, if you guys don't aren't catching what I'm saying or if it's not coming through, like that's my fault. So just tell me, okay? Okay, thank you. So, this is the big issue. Thyroid also does contribute. Um, in my mind, it's actually a, real, a I'm not going to say completely, but like relatively separate issue. I'm going to change that slide. Thyroid often will also com uh, compensate for the adrenals being burned out, but other things can impact it as well. Sometimes the adrenal glands are working overtime to compensate for a thyroid that's not working well. Um, the thyroid can have autoimmune or nutritional things wrong with it, or sometimes even infective. So that's a completely different talk. I'm not going to go into that just because it's really complicated. But the symptoms of that tend to be right there. Fatigue, constipation, low sex drive, and depression. Very similar to the other sorts of symptoms that we were just describing. 
why I call them the hormonal triangle of miseries, because they all kind of work together. Their symptoms are very difficult to distinguish aside from lab work, which is tricky. And um, it's not as tricky with the thyroid. The thyroid's actually relatively straightforward compared with the ser steroid hormones, but yeah. So we just need to keep in mind that the adrenal gland or the uh, thyroid gland can contribute as well. So this is the, pr when I treat male hormonal issues, um, there are two big things that tend to happen. And this is predominant. There are multiple variations of all of those themes that we discussed, but these are the big two. The first of which is adrenal exhaustion leading to male hormonal issues. This is the primary one I see with women as well, so it's actually, you know, men and women actually have very similar uh, diseases. They just come out, you know, expressed in their unique <coughs> physiology somewhat differently. And the second of which is unrealistic, run unrealistic expectations, and that is mostly a function of our culture. So, if a person is lucky to just have a chronic stress thing, because um, that's actually a lot easier to treat, there are three big things that I do with people. The first of which is hormonal balancing. Um, herbal medicine is the most amazing thing for hormonal balancing for men and for women. Um, I tend not to do testosterone replacement therapy and things like that, um, just because I find that it's really... It's like using a sledgehammer to get a nail. It's really quite blunt, and it's really quite blunt, and it it's very difficult to pulse effect or to mimic the body's natural physiology effectively. And when you can't mimic the body's natural physiology, generally nasty things happen. Um, I'll remind you all. Remember we discussed just a minute, just a little while ago, the um, women's hormone replacement and the whole issue with that, like, and all the diseases that came up because of it because those women were on very steady doses of hormones, same levels, all the time, every day. Yeah, I tend to avoid it for those two reasons, and because I do think that you know it is natural for people, it is part of the body's physiology and the body's kind of design to get to have a lower um, level of testosterone at certain points in your life. Um, so I do tend to do a male hormonal balancing herbs. Herbs generally, what they do is if a hormone level or a hormone variant or a hormone signaling molecule is too low, they raise it. If it's too high, they tend to lower it. There's a normalizing effect. Versus testosterone or just or versus just hormone replacement, they just raise. How do you know if you're raising it too much or too no, too little? How do you know if you're raising it too much or too little, you know, relative or relative to that individual as opposed to the lab ranges? You don't. That's the very tricky part. Lab ranges are constructed, as I said, on individuals who are in their 20s and 30s. I think if uh, you, uh, at a certain point in your life, have a requirement for testosterone that's lower, but you're raising it to get into the age range or to that sort of lab range that's you know determined by an average of um, average of people in their 20s and 30s, that's probably going to be too much testosterone for your body, and there are going to be consequences. So, works well with some men, and it seems to do a good thing for them. I tend not to do it for those reasons, because it's a shot in the dark much of the time, unfortunately. Um, the second thing that I do is adrenal balancing. So, adrenal balancing is actually relatively simple. There are herbs that, again, do this exact same thing. If there's too much cortisol or too much adrenaline or what have you, they will, or they will lower it. If there's not enough, they will raise it. There's a normalizing effect. I, um, herbal medicine is wonderful that way. I use acupuncture to do both as well. Acupuncture is an excellent mess, mess, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Modality. It's an excellent intervention to help the body do, to help the body rebalance itself. The last thing that I do is I, I do treat the underlying susceptibility leading to the stressed out state. That can be a number of things. It could be that your social network is really ridiculous. How many people have gotten better after they ditched their boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband or whatever? Like really, it's, it's amazing. Um, or how many people have gotten better after they fixed their relationship issues, after they've actually worked on them and they realize that they haven't been happy with their partner for a while because of you know, X, Y, Z. How many people have a toxic work environment or loneliness? One of the big things that I've really been prescribing lately is for people to get a girlfriend, and not girlfriend in a romantic sense, but a girlfriend or like a guy friend in the sense of like somebody to bitch with and to complain about life with and to go to the gym with and 
to hang out and have coffee with, and so forth. That's, you know, so we address that. And quite often, in addition to just social things, it's often an internal, an internal state. Um, it's a place where you and your personal growth are stuck in some way. So I do a lot of uh, homeopathy to treat that, and I, I combine it with counseling. So I will sit and talk with people for an hour and sit there and like, okay, so what's really bothering you? And well, it's not that simple. I have a number of ways of getting to that. But at the end, we know, we figure out exactly like, oh, this is my problem. This is where I'm stuck in life right now. And I know you can read lots of nasty things on homeopathy on the internet, but oh Lord, when you find that spot that people are stuck at, it's magic. It's like, oh yeah, no, that is not a problem even slightly anymore. I am flying and high and wonderful, which is exactly where you want to see your patients. Second thing is cultural. Um, our culture has, in addition to um, the other problems it has, it is very static expectations of what we should look like and what we should feel like. Um, we are all not going to perform like we're 15 years old for all of our lives. That is, I work with a lot of gay men and that tends to be the big issue. So, you know, when they're hit their 30s and 40s, there tends to be a lot of like, oh, I'm not performing the way I used to be. I have less value, therefore I'm a horrible human being. And it sounds pretty simplistic and silly, but that's kind of an unconscious thought process. That tends to be what happens. If we can't perform the way we've always performed, and we don't think that people change naturally and healthfully and you know wonderfully over their lifespan, then that's going to be a problem. Um, so sometimes it is just entertaining things like that, or like um, dealing with issues like that that are predominantly cultural. Um, a second thing is that uh, occasionally this flares up when sexual addiction is an issue. Um, sex addiction is a very real thing. It's increasingly recognized as a specialty in, in addictions counseling and so forth. And these people, when their sex drive does naturally start to slow down as they age, or alternately when it has to slow down because mechanically things aren't working anymore because of hormones or because of ad other addictive issues or because of health problems, these people tend to go into crisis. They don't need Viagra. They need counseling and they need to deal with that underlying um, issue and whatever other underlying health issues that we have or that they have. Are there any other, any questions right now? Is anyone not following me? Good, good, good. Genetics component? Yes. Now, that's I know that's a broad one. Everybody says that. But yeah. within um, variations within the human race, like yeah. your parents are from India, and I don't yeah. know you, how you classify that. Variations. Is there any study into that? Variations within groups tend to be greater than variations between groups. So if you can imagine humans as like, a be uh, like this spectrum of human um, function as like a bell curve, there may be, and you know, uh, and the middle point of the bell curve being kind of the average of a population. There may be slight variations among population, but the bell curve is just so big that it doesn't. And the bell curves are so close together that there doesn't really seem to be a huge difference. Like there seems to be a good spectrum of function and everything else throughout the human race that's approximately similar, even if each kind of individual ethnic group has a very slight difference in where the middle of the bell curve is. Yeah, so there are individual genetic differences. Um, so, uh, there are things we can do about that as well. Like one of the things that I've started doing is genetic testing people for nutrient, um, for how they utilize nutrients, and then you can specifically supplement them for that. Hormonal metabolism, the genetic testing hasn't matured to the same extent, but I don't doubt that it will. It may just be a couple of years. So, any other questions about male hormones? I'm going to leave it at there because those are pretty, that's pretty complicated. Or it, well, hormones in general are quite a complex topic. If something else comes up, you can certainly ask me. But, oh, yes. Andrew paused. Did Andrew I paused. Some, I had to step out, but did I miss anything about that? One more. Is that real? Yes. It's yes. almost the exact same thing as menopause. Almost the exact same thing. Can you just was, give a quick rundown of that? Okay, so men as well as women have a decrease in sex hormones in their 40s and 50s. Quite often when your sex hormones have been having issues for, you know, the adrenals have been sucking them dry for a long time because of chronic stress, mm -hmm. that tends to become much more challenging. Normally it should be a smooth transition. You know, your relationship matures, your sex drive lowers a little bit, but still functions. And 
you know, you be transition to becoming an elder in your society. Um, in our society, we don't really allow people to do that, and the hormonal system is so messed up by that time that women, you know, well, there's a, we know how menopause works in our culture. It tends to be quite, you know, challenging for women, and men also tends to be quite challenging, but without the social support. It's like, oh, menopause, that's not real, or, or something like that. It, it, it is quite real, and it is often, you know, driven into pathology by the habits we have in society. So, okay, women get hot flashes, what do they get? Depression. Oh. Depression. Thanks. Men tend to get depression and uh, loss of function and so forth. Women do too, but you know, women, the equi external equipment tends not to be as um, demanded upon. Like if women lose external function, quite often they simply lube up and keep going anyway. So um, that tends to be, so yeah, I know women also lose external function, but it tends to be less noticeable. Men lose external function and then, yeah. So depression's the big one though. Okay. So urinary tract issues. Men tend not to get as many acute urinary tract issues as women because the, the genital tract is longer. The bacteria have further to get up and so forth. But the prostate is a big thing. A prostate, if any of you don't know, this is just some basic physiology and anatomy. It's a small gland about the size of a walnut that completely surrounds the urethra. And the urethra is the tube that goes from your bladder to the outside. So it's what your urine has to go through. It makes a large number of substances which contribute both to the hormonal, <coughs> hormonal balance of male bodies and to ejaculatory fluid. It, when you have an orgasm, that fluid has a number of components. Sperm and uh, some of the hormonal components are made by the testicles directly, but a lot of the, the liquid that that comes in and the enzymes are made by the prostate. So, oh, you can't really see that, but, so the prostate, so here's your bladder, here's the tube coming through, here's a seminal vesicle that stores sperm. The prostate is that little thing right there. So, acute, in, so there's two big issues that happen with the prostate. Um, I, and, um, well, there's three actually. There's acute infections, these are very easily resolved. Antibiotics actually work relatively well here, so do naturopathic therapeutics. There's benign prostate hyperplasia, and one more that I didn't put down, but I consider an extension of benign prostate hyperplasia is prostate cancer. So I'll explain what BPH is. BPH is a condition, and this is important, of non-infectious swelling. When the prostate has an infection, it will swell. That's the natural response of the tissue. When it's infected, it swells up. Same thing happens with our sinuses. When we have sinus or respiratory tract infections, what happens? They swell up, you can't breathe anymore. Um, the prostate does this as well. The big thing with BPH is it's non-infectious. There is no culturable patholo or pathogen that's, there, that's visible there. Because the, um, urine, because the urinary tract goes through the prostate, this is a problem. If there's too much swelling, urine can't get through, and then you have backup, and you have a number of issues. I think this happens to a number of internal organs, but we just don't notice as much. The prostate is actually very visible, and it's palpable, so you can actually um, you know, touch it and figure out what's going on. I would suspect that many organs have as much, has the same problems as the prostate. They're just not as noticeable. It's a very interesting condition because um, there's no pathogen and historically it didn't occur that much. We don't have that many historical accounts of older men kind of having difficulty peeing and so forth um, in the same way. We have a, a historical accounts of elderly people you know, being incontinent, but this isn't really different than you know, what we see in a lot of, um, what we see in a lot of elderly people today um, so forth. There is a certain amount of incontinence that occurs when you get older especially like very, very old. Um, this one tends to be just relatively historically um, new, which is very interesting. I don't think this is, is, this is because, you know, people are living longer. Um, people, there were, like, the average lifespan was much lower in historical times, but there were people who lived a longer period of time and they knew about this and they, they you know, had this, and quite often, um, well, studying those people who survived to an older age historically with those people who, who are almost everyone who lives to an older age today is actually quite interesting. Um, I don't think it's because people were dying of infectious diseases. I think the environment really has changed that we find ourselves in. 
BPH does seem to require testosterone. Um, you guys remember the castrati? They used to be Italian. They were singers who were castrated so they would have a certain voice when they were older. Um, they didn't get it. But men who do have a testosterone do. So testosterone is required, but testosterone itself in the blood and, and blood levels and things like that and you know, relative, uh, having a relatively high versus low doesn't tend to impact um, BPH that much. Estrogen is actually the really big thing, which is fascinating considering the environmental, or considering what we know from environmental medicine. Um, as men age, an enzyme called aromatase, and aromatase basically converts testosterone to estrogen, tends to increase. This is not something that's pathological, this naturally happens a little bit. Estrogen does promote prostate swelling. And I, I should have, I, I wrote prostate swelling, but it really does tend to promote hyperplasia, the increase in the number of cells in the prostate, which leads to the prostate expanding in size. It's kind of like swelling, but it's a slight difference. We tend to think of testosterone as a male hormone and estrogen as a female hormone. Mm -hmm. That's not really accurate. Um, men have te estrogen in their bodies and women have testosterone. But there are, so different, different, there are differing regulatory cycles of each. The big thing right now that I suspect is causing all this benign prostate hyperplasia is excessive levels of estrogen in men. There are a number of sources of this and this is actually historically quite unique. So, there are several big sources. There are dozen, there are really quite a few hundreds of them. Environmental medicine is a new specialty within medicine where we're looking at the effect of pollution in our external environment on health and disease. And one of the big ones is called actually, is, um, deals with estrogens and deals with specifically xenoestrogens, estrogens from outside the body. The three major sources are um, soy products, so toy, uh, tofu, uh, tempeh, and particularly unfermented soy, like soy milk and um, edamame and so forth. Um, pollution from personal products. Personal products tend to be very, very estrogenic. Things like perfumes, gels, shampoos, and other such things. And internally generated estrogen. So estrogen that men are making themselves through physiological imbalances. You're all following me? Good, good, good. Where is, why would men be making more estrogen than they would be historically? Obesity. Fat, in addition to being very pro-inflammatory, is actually very estrogenic. Fat, just on its own, particularly belly fat, like not just fat that's you know on your thighs or your arms or your back or anything, but like this, the spare tire thing, is very pro-estrogenic. This tends to, and um, we actually see this epidemiologically, men with uh, increased weights and who are obese tend to have much, much, much higher rates of uh, benign prostate hyperplasia. Benign prostate hyperplasia as well does tend to, over time, increase the likelihood of prostate cancer too. I'm not going to go into prostate cancer as much just because I tend not to treat cancers. I tend to refer them to a friend of mine who's much more specialized in that because you know, cancer is a tricky thing. I don't, I don't know as much about it as I should in order to be you know, treating it. Um, but yeah, no. So we can apply most of these same insights to prostate cancer as well. We can think of prostate cancer as BPH that's just gone on for longer and started to mutate and go in on itself. I do do cancer prevention and I do do you know, post-cancer treatment. So, it, and I do have a video on YouTube um, detailing that as well. So if anyone wants to view that, it's, it's on my YouTube channel. And again, just like Paul Terrio, naturopathic. And I have another video there. So, how do we deal with this? The first of which is, fair, there's, two, so, there's two basic solutions with that. Male hormonal balancing again. And male hormonal balancing both, meet, both means regulating the level of male hormones you have, regulating the testosterone and how that is and how that goes up and down in your body, and dealing with the estrogen excess. Um, this is the area in which naturopathic medicine just shines. Conventional medicine can add in hormones. Taking them away is, they, you know, they can't really do that. 
Naturopathic medicine can't take hormones away, but it can help your body clear them out far more effectively. Things like making sure your liver is able to metabolize hormones better. Um, and there's another therapy that I'm very fond of called, called CEASE, which tends to help your body promote it, promote just the excretion and the metabolism of specific substances, including estrogen. So I really tend to like that. Uh, that tends to work very well. The second is weight loss. So there are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of ways of doing weight loss. I, many of them work, many of them don't work. If you ask me off camera or off, off tape, I will tell you about the ones I think work and don't work. I don't want to get sued when I put this on YouTube. So, but um, the one that I do, and um, the one that I actually find most effective is called Metabolic Balance. So it's a personalized food plan based on one, your own biochemistry. We do a ton of lab work, uh, work, figure out what kinds of foods will support your particular metabolism as indicated by that lab work. And then we come up with a dietary plan to support that. So in addition to promoting weight loss, which generally it does, it tends to, uh, it tends to um, balance out people's metabolism. Things like diabetes, thyroid issues, and female and um, you know, women's hormonal issues do tend to go quite a lot. To be, uh, they do tend to be resolved quite a bit by this. It's um, generally they average about three to six pounds a week of weight loss. There's no supplements or anything. There's no supplements or shakes, and it's it's like food you're doing. So in addition to food, um, so yeah, no, there tends to be no starvation, hunger, and so forth. So that's my little plug for my weight loss stuff. Everyone clear about that? Clear with like this is benign prostate hyperplasia and kind of the whole prostate deal. Um, clear? I was just I was just reading about um, this today. The, um, one medical authority in Canada is actually recommending discontinuing the PSA test. So the PSA test is the prostate specific antigen test. Mm -hmm. yeah. The prostate specific antigen is something that comes out of damaged prostate cells. They found that quite often that this doesn't correlate with the presence of cancer that well, and that it's generally not a worthwhile test to do. It's kind of like the same thing that happened with mammograms a while ago. They found that they detected a ton of like cancers and everything, but the vast majority of which would never have amounted to anything. So the cost of screening and the amount of money you'd save by treating a cancer early with mammo or a cancer with that was detected with mammograms early turned out to be less than the amount of uh, than the amount of like pain and suffering and money spent caused by treating all these false positives. It was a similar result with with the PSA test. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's one of the. I just made a video about um, what is naturopathic medicine, and that tends to be one of the great strong points of naturopathic medicine is allopathic medicine, conventional medicine tends to be the diagnosis and treatment of disease. So that tends to be what they focus on. And even when they do preventative medicine, it's always preventative of a specific disease. So they're trying to you know, screen people or detect a disease at an earlier state. That tends to be limited in its applicability. Naturopathic medicine is the promotion of health. We focus on getting your body healthier. And when, your body gets, when we get your body healthier, truly and genuinely, disease tends to not develop and it tends to go away by itself. Sometimes you still have to directly address it, but it's not as often. So that approach is far more effective preventatively because you're not trying to stave off any particular disease. You're focusing on the organism as a whole, as a just adult, becoming more of itself, becoming more healthier and better self-regulated. I could talk for days about that, but I'm running out of time. So cardiovascular disease. Um, contrary to popular opinion, it does not affect men more than women. Probably even or slightly more women get it, but it is a very strong, still a very strong killer of men. I could spend another couple of hours talking about this, but we can generally say it is an inflammatory condition. Something in the body is causing inflammation, particularly in the cardiac or in the, in the uh, vessel system, and it does, and that tends to set up the cascade. There are a number of things that I've noticed actually seem to relieve cardiovascular disease quite a bit, um, and or treating them tends to relieve it. So the first of which is pathogens, things like chronic strep infection, not necessarily sore throats, but just chronic walls of strep in, or hives of strep in the body tend to do quite a number on the heart. Um, there's also things like 
cytomegalovirus and chlamydia that do tend to promote this chronic inflammation in the body that one of the ways it leads it and tends to terminate is in heart disease. Another thing that tends to really be closely associated with that is sugar. Sugar is just evil. So good evil. <laughs> I love sugar so much, but it's evil. It does tend to promote that kind of a, the metabolism that really does favor heart disease as well. Is that any kind of sugar? Or sweetener, or oh, sweeteners worse, but in completely different. Oh, well, ways. chemical sweeteners, but yeah. there's like other natural sweeteners, stevia, etc., etc. Et I know stevia doesn't have data on it long term yet. I was talking about this with Ling one time. When I have stevia, I react as if I had sugar. Mm. So, I don't. I think just call this intuition. I was talking with Ling about this as well, and she has the same thing. Like, yeah, I react like it's sugar. Um, yeah, I think something people are going to start finding out nasty stuff about Stevie in the future. I, but I mean, a hint of mine. There's like coconut sugar now, and this and that, honey. and all. Honey and those things yeah. tend to be less bad. Yeah. If you make them a major part of your diet, they're still going to be problems. But the less processed a sugar, the less bad it is generally going to be. So coconut sugar, if it's less processed, probably fine. If it's the same old sugar that everyone else is using, but they get it from a coconut instead of from a sugar cane, I don't think that's going to do anything. <laughs> like that's going to be an improvement. So um, yeah, no, it tends to be it tends to be artificial and refined sugars. Sugars in fruit, for instance, if you don't have other other metabolic difficulties, tend to be fine for people. So yeah. So sorry I can't do this more justice, but this is a very long topic. The solutions, nutrition, weight loss, and metabolic balancing. They tend to be very, very effective in the treatment of this. Supplementation also tends to be very worthwhile. There are some very good supplements that, team, that tend to either stave off cardiovascular disease or completely redirect metabolic dysfunction that leads to it in the first place. Things like coenzyme Q10 and fish oil and a lot of mitochondrial supplements really tend to support the heart and so forth and the antibacterial therapies. If there is an underlying infectious etiology behind, or you know, the etiology means origin, if there is a specific infectious you know, dimension to someone's heart disease, you need to address that. And quite often antibiotics just aren't the best way. They don't work quite in that way. Really good for acute infections, not so much for the chronic long-term ones. Oh. Those are two ways that I use, um, no-sodes. So no-sodes are just homeopathic remedies made from a specific pathogen. Um, they can be pretty damn intense, but if you, use, if you know how to use them, and I do, they can be very effective for clearing long-term infections. And Sanum is just a particular style of products that really tends to uh, promote bacterial health in the body, and I, I really, really like them. Nobody uses them, which is very sad. Metabolic disease, we've largely addressed it. Um, diabetes is the main concern, but it's a, again a very big topic. I, I would sit here and talk to you guys for days on end if I could talk to you about all the stuff that I want to talk to you about, but I'm going to say that diabetes is also a big concern in men. Diabetes is probably slightly higher in men than women, and so the need for diets that are generally not so carb heavy, that emphasize proteins and vegetables rather than sugars and um, everything else. Tend to be uh, tends to be emphasized here. So um, there's one book that I tend to really like called the Bernstein um, Bernstein Diabetes Solution. I think it's called. It's not by the guy who the Bernstein who did all those weight loss clinics. It's by this man Bernstein who had the first blood sugar meter ever and started testing himself and came up with his own dietary guidelines and then you know, became an MD and. Uh, started a whole clinic based on that, and it turns out that his recommendations are the exact opposite of the American Diabetes Association. I trust him more than them. Last one, STIs. Treat a lot of gay men, see this a lot. Um, STIs, they're a very interesting kind of group of infections. They range from viral, such as HIV and uh, human papillomavirus, which men do get, um, chlamydia, syphilis, uh, gonorrhea, bacterial vaginosis, which tend to be bacterial, and others that I suspect are um, that, you know, there are probably fungal and uh, protozoal pathogens as well that just don't have names and aren't tested for routinely that I suspect are sexually transmitted as well. Um, acutely, as, uh, these, um, these are managed largely with um, 
with antibiotics, which does tend to work reasonably well, reasonably well. Um, a number of diseases such as uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea are now becoming increasingly antibiotic resistant. So antibiotics are becoming increasingly less effective with them. Um, as well, it's not as big of a problem with HIV in the West, but you know, a lot of virus, viruses are becoming resistant to their medications as well. Um, historically, these diseases were treated very well by NDs. Back in the day, you could cure, when people were generally healthier, you could cure syphilis with hydrotherapy and so forth. Like People would go and dunk you in pools of cold water and get you a healthy diet, get you exercising. What's and, ND? And naturopathic doctor. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, and so forth. Modern antibiotic treatment is a lot less intensive, but it's very good. It's a lot easier. You don't have to go away from your home for months getting dunked in the cold water by some sadistic naturopath and so <laughs> forth. But, there, but antibiotic treatment often leaves long-term immune effects. These effects can, over time, lower resistance to other infections and have uh, a long-term effect on your immune system. So antibiotics do tend to disrupt both the flora of the body, the bacterial balance, which is a thing that I very much like and am passionate about. Um, and they also do tend to, they do tend to have an overall lowering immunity, uh, an, immunity um, an immune dampening effect. They tend to lower up the overall functionality of your immune system, particularly in the case of STDs. I don't know why STDs really tend to be, have this particularly immune damaging effect, but it's almost unique among the infections that they do. So chronic amounts of like antibiotic treatment of STDs do tend to lower your resistance to other STDs. Um, there's an, some interesting statistics that people um, with um, syphilis tend to have like quite increased rates of HIV. And it was assumed for a long, and it still is assumed that it's just because there's an ul a physical ulcer present. With syphilis, there's usually an ulcer present that you know there's a barrier in the skin, which in any kind of or there's a break in the barrier of the skin, and any kind of break makes transmission of HIV a much, lot more likely. This, I don't think this is actually true. Syphilis, the ulcer lasts very rare, doesn't last that long. And the people who tend to be more likely to contract HIV if they have syphilis have secondary or tertiary syphilis, which doesn't have an ulcer. I suspect it's you know the effect of, of syphilis itself on the immune system, which makes um, HIV transmission more likely. Um, they do tend to have chronic immune, uh, immune and nerve system effects and mental emotional effects. And again, I don't want to harp on the gay men, but gay men do tend to get quite a high rate of sexually transmitted diseases, and I've seen all of these things. They tend to be quite devastating, especially if you know you're finding yourself, you know, you get an STD and you get it treated, but you're depressed afterwards, or and this goes on for years and years and years and years and years, and gets worse if you get another one. So yeah. The solutions are relatively simple. Um, I use homeopathics to treat the lingering effects of the disease. Um, this can be a little intense for people, but it tends to work quite well. Um, once you clear it, it's done. Once you find, like when you're fully cleared, when it is possible to fully heal from infections and from STDs and things like that, not all of them, like you know, HIVs, you know, that hasn't happened yet. But things like you know, syphilis, let's say you were having my memory problems after after a year after catching catching syphilis and it was treated antibiotically and you're still testing negative. Quite often, a good homeopathic can really give you a little bit of a you feel like you have the flu for a little while and then memory problems go away. So that's kind of my perspective on that. I do think that antibiotic treatment does not address every aspect of STDs, but there are solutions available. Um, Sanum therapy to rebalance the gut flora. So Sanum is very, very, very effective for rebalancing a person's digestive flora that are disrupted by antibiotics and treating the underlying susceptibility. If a person is going out and having promiscuous sex, whether they're gay or straight or whatever, they and for whatever emotional reason they have, that needs to be addressed. That is a root of exposure, and if they're kind of their life is playing out, this is kind of you know through sexual addiction or anything else, this is play, this is kind of how their uh, inner state is working out. Then that does need to be addressed for you know everyone's sake, especially their own. Oh my God, I'm exactly on time. Thank God. Um, does anyone have any questions for me? So what is salmon? Is it like a scopolis? Uh, no, it's not a probiotic. 
it's a that's a complex question. It's a series. It's Sanam is so when they started dealing with um, when you know people like Pasteur and Koch in the 19th century started uh, culturing bacteria and figuring out what they did. They had this assumption that a bacteria was kind of like a bat or a bird or something like they were species and they didn't mix. That is 100% not true. Um, bacteria do exchange genetic, inf genetic information all the time, and um, we term it in modern biology plasmids. Like they'll just, ex they'll kind of like, it's really funny. It looks exactly like, like if you see it, you know, it's like it looks exactly like sex with organisms. They'll, these little tubey things come out and they meet, and then the bacteria exchange plasmids with each other, and it's, it's adorable. Um, <laughs> But, um, so they do exchange things. So our ideas of bacterial species tend, I, I, I don't think they're accurate at all. Um, another guy named Enderlein saw all bacterial populations as just this great large organism exchanging genetics with itself and so forth. So he created a series of therapies where the genetic information of healthy bacteria could just be supplemented to people. And um, turns out it worked really well. So that's what a Santa remedy is. It's kind so of like, like a pill or what is no, it's, there are pills. Well, there's multiple forms you could do it in. There are pills and drops and creams and injectables and everything. And so anybody can take them. I wouldn't say anybody could take them. They're kind of behind the counter products for a reason. So okay. I, I, people tend not to be able to, like some people react really badly to them. And yeah, no, that's just something that needs a bit of supervision there. So is Senum, is it a brand name or like yeah, it's a, a brand category? Name. Oh, it's okay. a brand name, yeah. I believe it is, there is one company in the world that makes them and it was the same company that was started by Enderlein about a century ago and they still make them and they're quite popular in Germany and thank God we can get them in Canada. We can't get all of them and a gigantic shout of irritation to Health Canada. See, that way's west, Health Canada's on Ottawa. I shake my fist at you, Health Canada, because a lot of the products are still getting NPN, like natural product numbers, so I can't have them. And I use a lot of them to treat, you know, like my, my HIV patients and stuff. And so I'm like, oh, I've got two of these left, and I want to use them for this person, but I really need them for my HIV patients, so um, sorry. I've had to triage a couple, of, a couple of cases that way because I haven't been able to get access to those products, so I was a little irritated with Health Canada about that. Not that I'm angry at Health Canada, they, they try really hard to do their job, but yeah. So that's what Santa, it's just a brand name of products. So yeah, really useful. Probiotics also help, but probiotics, to use a metaphor, they tend not to stick if you've got unhealthy bacteria in your digestive system already. So there's just nowhere for them to go. Sanum tends to restructure the nasty bacteria, either so that they are cleared by your immune system, or alternately that they sort of resume, if they're bacteria that could either be nasty to you or nice depending on the environment, they tend to become nicer. So it tends to make probiotics much more effectively. Many people go on probiotics for years and notice only slight changes, like I put people on sanums and then probiotics and it's like permanent. So that's why I really like them. So as a middle-aged man now, mm -hmm. You know, sure, I can work on my diet, I can work on my stress. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned supplements at one point. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, rarely take, you know, or randomly kind of take an omega-3 mm -hmm. or a probiotic, but mm -hmm. that's it, though, really, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there is there one thing I should do? Should I try and take an omega-3 every day or a probiotic every day or a multivitamin or, like, I mean, if there were one thing yeah. I might do as, you know, no, no obvious pathologies or illnesses or anything? Like the one either. thing, if I was to, if I'm, so I'm not giving any one particular general medical advice just because of the legal consequences of doing that, sure. so I can't, you know, but if I was to recommend one general thing for the population, uh, or that I think the population could benefit the most from, it is um, eating well. There's a book called Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. It is a very good book. It is $25 or $28 or something like that at chapters. And it has, um, it has like very you know, nourishing traditions, Sally Fallon, very good book. And she has in her book a lot of recipes, but she has three big thing, three big pillars that she has um, that most traditional cultures that lived quite long ate. First of which is fermented vegetables, home fermented vegetables. If you ferment them outside, if you buy them at a store and they're not refrigerated, those things are sterile. Fermented vegetables are probiotic. They're very accessible, they're tasty, they're wonderful, you can ferment them yourself safely. 
second of which is a raw meat product of some kind. Not sushi, but things like steak tatar, or kibech, or it, it, kibech Lebanese, or um, steak carpaccio, or something like that. Those tend to be actually uni almost universal, like there's some raw meat product. And the third of which is, how did I get to four? Third of which is bone broth. Just bones boiled, either in whatever implements that culture had, like I use a slow cooker, because I think the slow cooker is God's gift to humanity, um, and just put in soups and rice and stews and things like that. Chicken works as good as beef. Chicken, chicken yeah. works as good as beef, yeah. Yeah, so those, those things tend to be the, like what if people ate that, they would tend to do quite well. I mean, I personally think everyone should go and see a naturopathic doctor and get like a good homeopathic every six months to help their personal growth and everything, but you know, I do. But alas, I don't think that's gonna happen for a couple generations at least. So, yeah. Anyone else? For those of you who aren't aware, our, our health uh, benefits do cover naturopaths. Spirit fingers to that. That's so. true, yeah. All right. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, nutritional, you said of biochemical testing, what was that, what call that? Oh, uh, Give me one second. So if anyone has any email questions to me or they want this presentation, just give me an email. My email's on my card uh, and I will send it to you when it's ready and I will make links, send it out to you, to everyone as well. So when this is on YouTube, you all can relive my, my presentation and everything as much as you want. And if you've got any questions, please do ask me and all my stuff's on the table. Okay, all right. Thank you. Do -do -do. San Jose, like